Thank you, Your Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, good morning to all of you. I want to commend Portugal and Kenya for everything that they have been doing in order to help mobilize our efforts here for the ocean. This is absolutely a critical moment for our oceans, yes, but also for our values and our principles. And as we gather here today, none of us can ignore the threat to the rules-based international order that Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine presents. We are gathering under the auspices of the UN, a rule-based structure. And everything that we do here relies on the rule of law. Everything that Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in its unprovoked and unjustifiable manner is a violation of that rule of law. So we join others in the urgent plea for Russia to immediately halt attacks to facilitate the unhindered flow of humanitarian aid to those in need, to grant safe passage to innocent, fleeing women, children, civilians, and to withdraw its military forces from Ukraine. Now, my friends, while Russia's actions in Ukraine are reprehensible, we cannot allow any of the excuses of Ukraine to stand in the way of the work we do this week and the work we must continue to do. The environment and climate don't suddenly stop because of an invasion. Lives are at stake, and our ocean touches every single aspect of our lives, from the air we breathe to the food we eat. Just over two months ago, many of us were in Palau for the seventh Our Ocean Conference, where more than 70 nations joined together in the middle of the Pacific to make more than 400 commitments valued at $16 billion in order to deal with the challenge of the ocean. We look forward now to Panama picking up next year, Greece the year after, and Korea has announced today that it will take the 10th anniversary Our Ocean Conference. And we hope this week will help keep building the momentum for what we need to achieve. First, we need to realize that no conversation about the ocean is about the ocean alone. You cannot separate the ocean from the climate crisis, and none of the climate crisis can be dealt with without the ocean solutions and vice versa. Harmful emissions are making our ocean warmer, more acidic, less productive, and we are driving rising sea levels. We cannot solve the ocean crisis without solving the emissions crisis. At the same time, the ocean is a source of climate solutions, and they can help to keep the 1.5 degrees target alive. For example, we need to spur the transition to green shipping. If shipping were a nation, shipping would be the eighth largest emitter in the world. In May, the United States and Norway announced a green shipping challenge for COP27 to help put that sector on a pathway towards full decarbonization, no later than 2050. Ten economies supported the challenge during the Major Economies Forum, and we encourage others to join. We also need to scale up offshore renewable energy. The United States has a goal to deploy at least 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030, and we encourage others to set similar targets. In addition, at the Our Notion Conference, we announced that Ocean Conservation Pledge encourages countries to conserve at least 30 percent of waters under their respective uh, jurisdictions by 2030. You can't get to 2030 globally if not more countries are choosing to do it locally. Because we cannot, we, we secondly finalize an ambitious and effective agreement for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, which would create for the first time a coordinated and cross-sectional approach to establishing high seas marine protected areas. Third, we must stop the practice of reckless, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. We have zero prayer of achieving SDG 14 as long as entire fleets of vessels continue to operate with impunity. 
One country alone has thousands of vessels knowingly fishing illegally. SDG 14 compels us, and I quote, to conserve and sustainably use oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Twice sustainability is mentioned, but the fact is we are not living sustainably. The oceans are not being fished sustainably. Too much money is chasing too few fish. More than three billion people depend on fish as a key source of animal protein, and the growth of consumption of fish outpaces today all terrestrial meat combined. IUU fishing is damaging our ocean, undermining maritime security, and endangering law-abiding fishers and communities. Over one-third of fish stocks are overfished, and the FAO estimates that one in every five fish caught originates from IUU fishing. We are allowing vessels, by indifference, to knowingly, even though sanctioned by governments, to follow a policy of IUU fishing. This violates both the laws of nature, the laws as we have passed them, and the laws of common sense. We must promote transparency and data sharing to understand the full complexity of IUU fishing, both in the high seas and the exclusive zones. This is why President Biden just signed a new national security memorandum setting out how the U.S. government will tackle IUU fishing and its associated criminal activities, such as the use of forced labor in the seafood supply chain. If we're going to succeed, my friends, we have to work together internationally. Together with the U.K. and Canada, we are launching the IUU Fishing Action Alliance to increase ambition, create momentum, and most importantly, action in the fight against IUU fishing. We have a unique opportunity to bring together those who are leading the fight in IUU fishing, countries, organizations, stakeholders who pledge to take urgent action to improve the monitoring, control, and surveillance of fisheries. It is no wonder, my friends, that citizens around the world lose faith in governance when we fail to back words with actions. Lastly, we must find, make this the moment that we advance our agreement on plastic pollution at every level. All of us have seen the pictures of conglomerated garbage in the Pacific Ocean, and yet the problem is only increasing. Human beings actually ingest microplastics at the level of about one credit card per week without knowing it on a global basis. The UN mandate that was just decided at UNIR 5.2 to launch multilateral negotiations on global and legally binding agreement is more than welcome. It must translate into plastic reduction. So my friends, I close simply by saying that we've been to these conferences. We have witnessed the passage of time. This is the moment where we must put in place solutions for future generations. And that is the only way we can live up to our responsibilities. Every one of you here are leaders and pioneers with respect to the ocean. The ocean problems, however, are human-induced. They are subject to human solution. We can win this battle, and I hope that here in Lisbon, we will help to create greater momentum in the effort to do that. Thank you. I thank Special Presidential Envoy for Climate of the United States for the meaningful statement and for highlighting Russia's illegal aggression against Ukraine. I now give the floor to His Excellency Zhang Zhanghai, Special Envoy of the Government of China.